the, the location that we're in is uh, downtown London at the forks of the Thames River. So this is a very uh, significant flooding location because we have the north branch of the Thames River meeting the south branch of the Thames River at this point. And the two of these rivers have roughly the same drainage area. So when we have flood events, the flood peaks and both of these are rivers will often arrive at this point at the same time. In, the, in July 2000, we had a flood event in this area that we would have had in the area of 20 to 25 feet of water going in this spot where I'm standing. The water actually got as high uh, as the almost the top of the old area or the older portion of the West London dikes that are in behind me here. Um, and we actually, they would have, if we hadn't have controlled that water level with Wildwood Dam and Fanshawe Dam, we actually would have exceeded those West London dikes and then the neighborhood in behind there would have filled up with water. What we did here is we did an analysis of what would have happened if we wouldn't have had Fanshawe Dam operating during the July 2000 flood event. And what this analysis shows is that um, during the event, the flood waters would have overtopped the West London dikes, and it shows the extent of flooding that would have occurred in the West London neighborhood. And for comparison purposes, as we did an analysis showing what actually happened in the July 2000 flood event. And this illustrates the uh, raising of the flood levels. Using Fanshawe Dam, we were able to keep the flood waters from overtopping the West London dikes, and the uh, flooding didn't uh, extend beyond the corridor. We've used Fanshawe since it was put in in the 50s many times to reduce the downstream effects of flooding within the city of London. Um, Basically, the area that drains into Fanshawe, Fanshawe has the ability to store the equivalent of about 25 millimeters of that runoff, which means, if you can imagine the whole 1,400 square kilometers that is upstream of this, that drains into this, you, if you could imagine that all covered with one inch or four, 25 millimeters of water, that could all be stored in here. In 2008, 2009, we had um, three floods within a 10 month period that the water flowing into the reservoir here was at you know, up to the 25-year, 50-year return. Water was up um, over over seven meters um, into this area behind you, so you can imagine that's getting right up into the, uh, well into the floodplain in behind us. And with that, we're able to uh, limit the flooding that happened downstream by a cut the flows in about half. The natural function of a floodplain is very similar to what goes on in behind Fanshawe Dam where uh, water gets stored and what ends up happening is, is the downstream areas then get less flooding because of the water that's been stored in the floodplains. If you start to fill in the floodplains with residential areas and then protect those areas with uh, flood control dikes or walls of some type, you end up taking away some of the natural storage of the system and you end up creating a problem where you're creating more flooding downstream than there otherwise would be. Yeah, in a, dry, in, a, in a dry year like this, we often have people that um, come up with ideas where they'd like to develop near the floodplain. And, and we do often have a number of years where you have uh, dry winters or less snow winters. We uh, maybe don't have as big of spring freshet, and people forget about floodplains. And, and people's memory... Um, and people's memories aren't that long when it comes to these kinds of risks and one of our jobs is to keep people reminded that um, the kind of flooding we're protecting for is a, a, a flood that we'd expect to see once in 250 years. Um, the minimum level in Ontario is the kind of flood we'd expect to see once in every 100 years. But um, the impact of a flooding like that would be devastating on a, a community if you had a community built in a floodplain like this. Mm -hmm.